So should we as Christians test what is happening inside Christianity against the word? Yes. What's up YouTube, Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode, I am always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And today we need to have a conversation about criticism. So stick around. <music> I made a mistake with that Asbury Revival video in that I allowed Facebook to promote the video from the 1517 Films Facebook page. Shouldn't have done that. Um, main reason being anytime anyone kind of engaged with it, apparently they got a message seemingly from me, which irritated them to no end. So lesson learned, never doing that again. But there's been a lot of comments on the post and I'm comparing analytics between Facebook and YouTube and what I'm seeing is there's post engagement but no one's watching the video. The post engagement, the, the overarching theme is because I asked the question, should we as Christians criticize the Asbury Revival? And the overarching answer is no. Who are you? How dare you? Um, and, and we're going to kind of walk through one comment that I got uh, and, and because this just it encapsulates everything. So the question for today is, should Christians criticize things that are happening in the church? The biblical answer is yes. Yes, we should. We absolutely should. Uh, but let's, let's look at the comment, um, and I'm going to have it, oh, wrong side, up here um, with, with, every, with all the pertinent information blurred out uh, so that you can't see who said it. Um, because the last thing I would want is, is to, I mean, it's there, it's public. You can go on Facebook and find it. I'm not going to delete it, but let's look at it. Should we criticize the Asbury Revival? In that case, should we criticize Azusa Street Revival? How about the Great Awakening? Um, yeah. Yeah, actually, we should. Um, and I'm going to reference some scripture later on in the video. Um, that Azusa is the problem. And Azusa, uh, I think, matches the criteria from the verses I'm going to be bringing up later. Uh, that abs this, is the, this is the root of the problem. This is the root that caused the tree to go bad, which is now bearing rotten fruit, is Azusa. Um, so yeah, absolutely, we should criticize those. Um, then it goes on, heck, um, let's go ahead and criticize the birth of Jesus in a cow barn. I mean, seriously? No. Um, Jesus, Jesus was laid in a manger. Um, the scripture makes that clear. There's no real criticism. Now, whether or not it was a barn or a cave or probably likely the lower room of the house where the animals were brought in at night because it was cold, it doesn't change anything. The, the, Jesus was still laid in a manger. So the, 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 we're comparing apples and oranges here. Um, you're talking about going toe-to-toe, face-to-face -to -face with Almighty God. Let's consider this all the way to its end. No. Um, <laughs> I'm not going toe-to-toe -to -toe with God. Um this presupposes that what happened at Azusa and the Great Awakening and Asbury was of God. But without any sort of biblical discernment on whether or not it is, you're just blanketly saying someone says this is of God, therefore it is. And we as Christians are not called to do that. We're not called to be that way when something like this happens. Uh, you want to tell God what he can and can't do. Am I saying by criticizing Azusa or the Great Awakening or, or the Asbury Revival, am I telling God what he can or can't do? I'd like to quote myself on this one if I could. Now, I know the criticism has been, who are you to say what is or isn't revival or what God can or cannot do? The answer? No one. I'm no one. I have no right to say what God can or cannot do. I do not put God in a box, but he does. 
Oh, that's right. I said I have no right or place to tell God what he can or cannot do or to put him in a box. But he has put himself in a box. And I can judge the actions of Christians based on the box God has said he will be in. So, by whose authority? Who has the authority to criticize Azusa and the Great Awakening and Asbury? God. Has he criticized it? Yup. Am I just repeating back what God has already said? Yup. Uh, when you're done and sin and destruction has ravaged your life, your church, your village, your state, your country. I, I, I guess um, if I don't go along with mainline American charismaticism, um, it's going to wreak havoc on the country. I that, This is kind of starting to smell like Christian nationalism a little bit, which is a sin. Um, which, also, a side note on this, um, I saw someone on TikTok say that uh, they're not going to respect anything to do with Christianity uh, or any kind of Christian revival until they come right out and condemn Christian nationalism. So I want you to hear me. I condemn Christian nationalism. Uh, do not even think of placing it in God's lap. Why? I am supposed to lay everything at his feet. I am to go to him with everything. And he will exchange my burden with his, and his is the lighter one. His is the one that brings peace. Uh, wake up. <laughs> Tell me you don't actually have anything intellectual to say without telling me you don't have anything intellectual to say. Wake up. Um, hear your spirit deep inside that shell you call a body. Your spirit and soul are so thirsty for God. Mm-hmm. They are. And that's why I'm a part of a church that engages correctly with word and sacrament ministry so that I can have, I can have that. So that I can quench my thirst. So that I can go to the living water and never thirst again. The people that were at Asbury are thirsting for God. That's why they went. And the only reason I made the video that I made was to tell them, that's not where the water is. It, you're thirsty. I can see it, it plain as the big Italian nose on my face. I can see it in you. You're thirsty for God, so come and drink. That's all I was saying. Uh, you and I have no idea how to look at a move of the Spirit and judge it. Yeah, we do. There is a standard by which we are called to judge this. There is a standard. And this, especially, you can see countless examples throughout the Old Testament of God's people falling into false doctrine, which leads them into false practice, which leads to God punishing them. Sometimes. Other times, a lot of the Old Testament is the prophets calling the people back the Old Testament is filled with revival, but it's calling God's people back to what is good, right, and salutary. When their charismaticism got the better of them, it was the prophets that were called by God that responded to the charismatic actions by saying, thus saith the Lord. And so when we as Christians see charismaticism in the church, we respond back with, Thus saith the Lord. You check out when Jesus was born and crucified. Religion and politics led Jesus to the cross. Nope. Um, if you had any shred of biblical literacy, you would know that it was the will of the Father and Jesus' obedience to his Father's will that brought him to the cross. We know this because, well, we can read, and because Jesus himself said, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. Jesus looked at Pontius Pilate and said, you have no authority over me. I'm in charge. So uh, go ahead and criticize. When Father God Almighty rains down on you, don't act like you weren't told. So I guess this is a case of spy versus spy uh, because we're both meh with each other. The, 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 there's two schools of thought here. There's two ways of looking at this, there's a, there's two sides to this coin. Uh, it's a Christian coin on either side, uh, but there's two sides. So there's one side that says, this is what the Bible says in plain language, a 
according to the rules of grammar and context. Oh, and if that isn't enough, um, here's 2,000 years of Christian authorship on the topic that matches with what the scriptures are saying. So this is how we know the church always believed, taught, and confessed this throughout history. This is why we're grounded in this. And then there's the other side that says, uh, I don't care. Stop judging me. Stop criticizing me. You have no right to tell me how I feel or what my experiences are with God or to judge my relationship with Jesus. I saw this. I felt this. I experienced this. Where does the authority lie on either sides of this coin? One lies on the word of God and the other lies in ourselves. And that's a problem. Look, I'm just as much of a charismatic by my nature as anybody else inside Christianity. The only difference is this reigns me in. This and the writings of the ancient church fathers that say the same thing this says in the same language it says it is reign my charismaticism in. Here's a really good illustration, actually, of the, the things that rein us in and keep us focused on what God's word says so we don't go nuts. So let's, let's get to some scripture here because there's the, uh, two sides of the coin, two schools of thought. Let's keep that trend going. On one side, there is God's word that says delusion is coming to the church in the last days. And there's the other side, the evangelical preachers that's saying revival is coming, revival is coming. Who's right? Well, let's turn. We're just going to use Thessalonians and Timothy. So this is all about, uh, this is 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12, concerning the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. If you want to know who the Antichrist is, I highly recommend reading uh, uh, from the Lutheran Confessions, a treatise on the power and primacy of the Pope. It's, it, 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 he matches. Um, so, but here's what we're looking for. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. So you can point at all the signs and wonders at Azusa and the Great Awakening and even at Asbury. And it's not going to shake me because I'm so familiar with the word and I know that these miraculous signs are connected to the Antichrist. Basic, simple, boring Christianity is, is the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Boring by comparison uh, to charismaticism, not actually boring. Orthodox Christianity is way more fascinating than charismatic Christianity. Then we go to 2 Timothy. Um, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Um, that's um, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 3, the, the whole swath of it is 3, 1 through 7. I just picked out um, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. And then, then it says to avoid such people. So is the power of God rolling around on the floor and babbling incoherently? Or is the power of God like Christ in, as an infant in the manger? Simple bread and wine, which he promises is his body and blood given and shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. Hmm... But the big kind of nail in the coffin on this one, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myth. So should we as Christians test what is happening inside Christianity against the word? Yes. What are we called to preach? Our emotions, our experiences, charismatic, miraculous wonders and signs? No, we are charged in the presence of God Almighty and of Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead. We are charged to preach the word, the word. And when the word contradicts the charismatic events that are happening inside Christianity and warns us that these are signs of a great delusion that is coming to the church, the signs of the coming of the lawless one. These are things that are going to lead people astray. And then we watch the people who engage in this 
walk away from sound doctrine and refuse to listen to sound preachers, and we read this verse, what are we supposed to think? If it weren't for the criticizing of bad doctrine and bad practice, we wouldn't even have half of the New Testament. And there is cynicism and sarcasm in that. I mean, Paul had to write to the Corinthians twice. And I think if we were to take his letters to the Corinthians and kind of paraphrase them into a letter to the American church, I think it would be Paul's, Paul's response to American Christianity would be, I love you, but you're awful. And Paul would be well within his rights as an apostle to say something like that to American Christianity. When he wrote to the people of Galatia because they were being fed a false gospel, a gospel of works, a gospel of the barbaric practice of circumcision as being a part of salvation, Paul's reaction was just the whole thing. The twig and the giggleberries, just get rid of it all. Just chop the whole thing off. Like, look, we're done. Circumcision was an old covenant. It has nothing to do with your salvation in Christ. Grace, faith, scripture alone, justified by grace through faith in Christ is, is, is Paul's battle cry, not by works. And most of the world has actually come on board with the, the barbaricism of, of uh, circumcision. America, we're still retarded and, and mutilate the genitals of our boys all the time because we're stupid, but that's a whole other story. As many times as the Bible says to be patient and loving and kind and gentle-hearted with people, there are examples of even the apostles under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit using frustration and sarcasm to get their point across. So when used properly and scripturally, both are appropriate. So should we as Christians criticize anything that happens inside the church? We as Christians should criticize everything that happens inside the church. And if it weren't for me as a, a charismatic criticizing what I was learning at a Lutheran university, I wouldn't have become a Lutheran. The people that I was criticizing were patient and kind and, and even sarcastic and cynical with me sometimes and readjusted me and how I was choosing to criticize. And I learned. And I, re I looked at the Lutheran confessions and I looked at the scriptures and I went, these two things say the same thing and I became a Lutheran. I grew as a person and as a Christian by criticizing. Criticism has its place inside the church. We are called by the word of God to test every spirit, to test everything. But what is the litmus test? What are we testing it against? The word. That's what we're testing it against. So I'm sorry, charismatics, whatever you are experiencing, whatever you are doing, Whatever's happening with you guys, I am going to test it against the word and I'm going to default to what the word says. And that is my unanimous stance on this. It's really disheartening that so many people engaged with something as important as, as that video was and chose to comment it and tear it to shreds without even watching it. And I can compare the analytics and I know that they haven't. But for you that have subscribed to this channel, you that comment on a consistent basis, you guys are awesome. And you guys have asked me some really good questions and disagreed with me on some things or how I said something or asked me to say it a different way. And I've learned so much from you, probably more than you've ever learned from me just being an asshole talking to his camera. So at the end of the day and before the camera cuts off again, we're just going to call that a video. Um, yes, Christians are to test everything that happens inside the church against the scriptures so that we can be on guard against the great delusion that is coming to the church that is going to draw us away from the word of God. Because it is the word of God that tells us that Jesus was crucified, died, and rose again for us and for the forgiveness of our sins. It is the scriptures that tell us how Jesus has chosen to give us that forgiveness every day of our lives. The scriptures matter. Doctrine matters. It mattered enough to the apostles to actually write the New Testament to correct it. It matters to us to read, learn, and inwardly digest these things so that we can be good and faithful witnesses, so that we can make that good confession, so that we can say to the world the same things the scripture says to us. We need to same speak the Bible. 
the only difference is those of us who are same speaking the Bible are the ones that are being criticized by the ones who are too illiterate to even pick the thing up because their emotions and their experiences matter more to them. So for you, all of you, whichever side you are on, charismatic or orthodox, until next time, may God bless all of you in the grace and the mercy that is won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.